Hello guys and gals, and this is part 20 of our reading of A Natural History of Dragons, a memoir by Lady Trent, and this is a book by Marie Brennan. Okay, and we're going to go over the copyright information, which is right here, and I'm going to find the information here in the book. Here we go. It says right here, A Natural History of Dragons, copyright 2013 by Bryn Noonschwander. All rights reserved. Interior illustrations by Todd Lockwood. Maps by Riss Davies. And designed by Greg Collins. Now, in the last book, last part rather, in part 19, um, Lady Trent, otherwise known as Isabella Camhurst, and her husband Jacob, they set out to explore this region of the map that was currently blank or empty, where there were no dragon dens. And they basically also took um, Dagmira's brother with them, Ilgish. And um, we'll find out if they found anything there. Meanwhile, um, the rest of the, the crew was looking, was, um, went to find the um, Boyer, but that is a different story. Okay, here we go. We're probably going to start back here a little ways. I forget exactly where we left off, but we're going to start. Um... Okay, we are going to start at this page. There's going to be a little bit of um, backtracking here, but like I say, I don't remember exactly what's going on. The next day, we began our exp exploration. No more the headlong marching of the previous day. Now we picked our way carefully, one eye on the sky above, one on the ground ahead. Approaching from Drustenev sent us through one of the gaps in the circle. I had noticed there were, so far as we knew, no layers in the immediate vicinity, but once inside the circle, who knew what we might find? It was wildly beautiful terrain. If you have the spirit within you to appreciate true wilderness rather than the groomed version that appears in romantic paintings. I have never liked Vistrani, oh, Vistrana so much as I did on, the, on that journey. Though how much of that was the scenery and how much my circumstances stretched my wings with my husband at my side, I cannot say. The stone here was quite porous, so that we had to steadily, so we heard a steadily, a steady soft rushing from some, from, from snow melt flowing along below the ground, and here and there found a small waterfall cascading from a broken rock. For once, my Exertions were strenuous enough that I was actually glad for its icy touch upon my face, though I still, but though it still left me gasping. I expect, I expect there are caves, Jacob said, peering up one of the cracks from where the water issued forth, but they may not be large enough for layering. I retired the, I retied the laces of my boots and shoved errant strands of hair back beneath my Vestrani handkerchief with which I had restrained their fellows. Whatever accounts for the circle, if indeed there is any such thing, will be found at the center. We forged onward until we found our way blocked by another ravine, even more forbidding than the one we had traversed on the way here. This one looked like the mountain had been split open by a great axe. A steep crevasse, too wide to be bridged by a fallen tree, too long to be conveniently circled. Have you ever seen, oh, have you ever been here before? I asked Ilgish. He shook his head, peering over the edge in a way that made me, made my muscles twitch with the desire to pull him back. What do you think is at the bottom? More brambles, more brambles in all likelihood, but I didn't say it. I heard in his voice the buoyant energy of a young man who cannot see a challenge. 
like that ravine slope without wanting to conquer it. I shared his impulse in more feminine form. This was not precisely the center of the circle I had marked, but perhaps the secret lay here. Our map was not exact, after all. The dragons might be less than entirely precise themselves. Jacob had caught the same enthusiasm. He grinned at me and said, I once climbed Mathery Crag without ropes on a dare, but I think we will use ropes here. I was glad I was glad of that, as I have never climbed anything more challenging than a tree, and and that in skirts. Fortunately, the slope was not quite vertical, at least not on, on not, not on our side. The far wall was a different matter, overhanging the base of the ravine and casting it into a shadow. If we had to go up that side to continue our search, I suspected our exploration would end there. We tied our first rope around the, a sturdy tree, and then Jacob used it to steady himself as he descended. Once he found a suitable place to stop and attached another, I began to follow him. The disadvantage of this method, I discovered, was that I must face the cliff. Not all portions of the slope required me to cling to the line, but if I turned to see where I was placing my feet, it put me in a bad position for those times when I, when I did require it. The final stage of our descent was even steeper in the end. Jacob had to re to teach me how to abseal, which I was not very good at. I cracked my knees repeatedly against the stony wall, and my ribs were quite bruised from the constriction of the rope by the time I reached the comparatively level floor of the ravine. Once Jacob had extricated me, I staggered off a few steps, to lean against a boulder and nurse my pains in private while he guided Ilgish through the process. The sheer quiet of the place struck me. The curve of the ravine was such that it blocked the wind rather than channeling it. I had not realized just how ever-present that sound was here until it faded. The verdant undergrowth rose around me like some kind of enchanted jungle, until I almost expected a talking fox to walk out of it like in one of those old nursery tales. Oh, one of my old nurse's tales, rather. I did not fancy the notion of climbing that rock face again, even with the ropes, but it was but it was worth it. And so were my bruises and scrapes for the sheer pleasure of this place. And for the sight that greeted my eyes when I looked around the curve when I looked around the curve to what lay beyond. The overhanging wall on the far side of the ravine concealed an enormous black opening easily 50 feet across. Sorry. Where's my thing? There it is. Oh, yeah. We're running low on power. Sorry about that. Um, I might need to cut that. As for the end for the site that greeted my eyes when I looked around the curve to what lay beyond. The overhanging wall on the far side of the ravine concealed an enormous black opening easily 50 feet across the d and deep enough that I could see nothing of what lay inside, a cave most definitely and far larger than any we had seen used as a lair. But I remembered my half-serious comment about a queen dragon, and my mouth went very dry. Isabella, Jacob called out. I nearly jumped from my skin. Swiftly I turned to wave at him, both to show him where I had gone and to silence him. He frowned in puzzlement at my urgent gesture, but did not argue. Moving as quietly as he could across the rough ground, he joined me while Ilgish unwrapped himself from the rope. What is... Jacob began. He never finished the question. He... His gaze fell upon the cave opening, just as mine had, and I suspected I had ga gaped in much the same way. I, have, I haven't seen anything moving, I said in a murmur, and went on and went no further. That went no further than us. Jacob shook his head. No, you wouldn't. They are 
crepuscular hunters, after all. At this time of day, any rockworm would be sleeping in the sun, any healthy one at least, but they prefer their layers far smaller. To be precise, they prefer their layers a bit bigger than themselves. You haven't seen anything that large in the sky, have you? Of course not. He and Mr. Wilker would have fallen over their own feet to come tell us, Jacob frowned. Uh, Jacob frowned. I don't see how anything that large could fly. Granted, we don't understand very well how it works. Even, even with the dragons we've seen, we don't know enough about their anatomy yet. But surely there must be a limit. A limit to what? It took some comfort from the fact. Oh, I took some comfort from the fact that Jacob too leapt a foot in the air at Ilgish's question. The boy was far quieter across the ground than either of us, but spoke far more loudly. He looked taken aback, and then I frantically hushed him. Nobody's ever seen a dragon that large, he said, in a lower tone, once we had explained. N not outside of stories. Stories like those about Zagret Mott. I was not going to calculate what that creature's wingspan might, be, might supposedly have been. He was associated with the ruins anyways, not with this cave. Assuming Dagmira was correct, Jacob straightened, looking back to where he dropped the supplies we brought down with us. Well, now, well, now would be the safest time to explore. We gain nothing by delaying. Thinking back, I suspected, I suspect him of a degree of bravado, not wanting to show fear in front of his wife. It was the salutary effort of inducing a similar bravado in me, though which may not have been what he intended. <coughs> I couldn't agree more. Do we have torches of any kind in that pack? Bravado or not, we approached the cave carefully, skulking along the base of the overhanging wall until we reached the mouth. There we paused, all three of us listening mightily mightily for any any sounds within. The only things we heard were the, the steadily drip of water and the echoing silence of empty space. Jacob went first, followed by Ilgish, both of them gripping um, rifles tight. I remained outside for the moment, an unlit torch in hand. They kept close to the wall, not wanting to silhouette themselves against the brightness outside. The ground sloped down before them, and I realized what had seemed like oh I realized what had seemed like a low ceiling um, serrated by stalactites like a dragon's maw, an image I could not shake was nothing of the sort. The cave broke through to open air near its top, and the men were now descending toward the depths. Down, down they went, Jacob drawing ahead of Ilgish farther and farther until I could scarcely make him out at all in the darkness. Then he moved, and a moment later Ilgish turned to beckon me. Jacob had seen nothing, heard nothing. We could risk, we could risk light. I struck a match and lit the torch. We had lanterns, too, but those would not make the slightest difference in this enormous black void. Even the blazing light of the torch created only a small island of light bobbing nervously around me as I picked my way down to join the men. Stay back. Uh, stay behind me, Isabella, Jacob murmured, to not turning. I don't want, I don't want the torch to blind me in case he had to shoot something. But the cave had a dead dead feeling about it. The subconscious mind hears breathing, tiny movements, all the little sounds of life, and there and here we heard none. Nor, as we begin to examine our surroundings, did we see any of the castings or marks we associated with dragon lay with dragon's lair. The stone all about us had formed into queer shapes, stalactites and stalagmites and things I didn't have names for, 
flowing sheets of stone, I would not have believed until I saw them for myself. Um, what we did, what we did note faintly near the entrance, and more strongly, the further we went was the smell. Ah, oh, I whispered, wishing for the first time in my life that I was one of those ridiculously little nosegays young ladies carrying around and sniff from every time they want to politely imply an insult. What is that? Are there dragon eggs down here that have gone rotten? Sulfur, Jacob murmured back. Our sibilants rebounded from the stone, whispering off into the depths of the cavern. There must be a source of it somewhere. Neither of us had, was a chemist, so I will unnote my husband's comment with a detail from Mr. Pegshaw's excellent ge geographical treatise, Method of Cavern Formation in a Variety of Environments, which we became quite relevant later. The rotten egg smell came from deposits of sulfur, but from not came not from came, um, the rotten egg smell came not from deposits of sulfur, but from hydrogen sulfide gas seeping from some source far below. We were fortunate in the extreme that its concentration was not high enough to pose an incendiary risk, and that we did not go deep enough into the cavern to encounter the stronger pockets. When this gas meets water, it forms sulfuric acid, which creates, which created the cave system, whose topmost chamber we were now exploring. The Drusenev caverns, as they are now called, have been the object of mapping efforts by later spillologists, and as I understand it, they're more accessible parts have, be, have become something of a tourist attraction in recent years, but the full extent of the system is still unknown, and the mighty void we had, in, had entered is off-limits to all. We certainly felt like trespassers, but as the floor leveled out for a time, Jacob ventured outward from the wall. We had no fear of becoming lost, not not so long as we could see the pale oval of the cavern mouth at the top of the slope. And before we had gone very far at all, we found something entirely unexpected. I thought at first it was another rock formation, the light glistening off it oddly, though, and, though, and I recognized first with curious surprise, then with an unpleasant jolt that it was a pile of, of rotting meat, a pile in which limbs could be discerned. To be precise, the hind leg of a dragon. Had the sulfur stench not obliterated the, the competing smell, I suggest I would have felt very, very ill. As it, was, as it was, my thoughts kept instead to my original nearly discarded hypothesis that this was in fact the layer of a mighty rock worm, and furthermore, one that ate its own kind. That, that not the rot, was the, that was turning my stomach. Ilgis was morbidly fascinated going forward to inspect it. Jacob turned quite in, incautiously to start, to stare straight at me and to touch. Oh, and, and the torch. Isabella, he said. My own logic had followed the same trail. The leg was not being eaten. Oh, the leg had not been eaten. It had been dropped there, perhaps in rather battered condition to begin with, and then left. I could not guess at rates of decay, not in this environment, where even flies would not come. But I only knew of two rockworms that had died so recently, and one of them... I had examined in, in quite a bit of detail before the body had vanished. This was, I was certain, the hind leg of our missing dragon. Not, nor was I alone. Farther up, we discovered what I 
could only surmise was the remaining pieces of the beast thought by thought by then okay though by then it was far enough gone that i was not eager to conduct a tally we could discern though to be certain to be sure that it was indeed been torn apart and mr wilker as mr wilker indicated that shocking morning but it had not been carried off as food instead the dragons had borne the remains here why we had been we had been long enough about our exploration that my torch was beginning to gutter the noxious air too took its toll on us collecting illness we fled back to the green quiet of the ravine and there collapsed on handy bits of stone to stare at one another and conduct a discussion the boy could not follow in the least for we spoke skrilling neither of us was in any state of mind to force our ideas into vestrani have you ever heard of elephant graveyards jacob asked only in very sedimental tales i said wiping sweat sweat from my brow the sun now stood overhead bathing the the still air with heat but i could not say with honesty that was the cause of my perspiration i thought them a cloying notion invented for children jacob rinsed his mouth with water and spat into the underbrush trying to clear away the sulfuric tinge they may or may not be real hilford would know but dragon graveyards no one has ever speculated as, as to those um we don't know it is a graveyard i pointed out one burial or deposition or whatever i should call it is not a pattern but if there were others they will have disintegrated by now because i am a particular a, part, a practical woman the thought did cross my mind that we could test the graveyard theory by killing another dragon and seeing if its fellows carried him off in the same way but although i am not above shooting creatures for science i balked at doing it so callously to answer only a single question indeed i was rather less sanguine about having done it at all now that i faced the notion of dragons actually carting what or caring what happened to their brethren it seemed such a peculiar peculiarity a pe oh, peculiarly human thing to do something that sets us apart from the beasts if they mourned their own kind at least we no longer feared the return of a hyper hypothetical queen dragon though we kept one more eye out in case dragons of ordinary size were to visit the ravine indeed i found myself wondering if the reason our dead beast had been torn to bits was because he was otherwise too heavy for his fellows to carry here without a tame dragon to try with different loads i couldn't be certain or perhaps if we observed one in the act of carrying off a bear i dragged my thoughts back to the present question was this an aberrant aberration or a pattern okay let me um we have a picture here i'm going to take a picture here there and this is a picture of the dragon graveyard mindful of the need to climb back out of the ravine before it grew too late we could only explore a little further torches in hand we went back into the cave finding only more the rotting pile we had not imagined it then and branching out from there we almost overlooked the evidence there were as i have said many peculiar rock formations in the cave in addition knob or stick here an additional knob or stick there here or there hardly attached attracted an eye i am embarrassed to say that we might have missed it entirely had i not quite literally tripped over it 
My torch skittered across the ground, and Ilgis picked it up. Jacob came to help me to my feet and stopped halfway through the act of pulling me up. My heels slid across the slick stone, dri uh, dropping me hard on my rump, and I made an indignant sound. If you're going to offer, then kindly do not. Then I saw what he had spotted. It, it stuck out from the side of a lumpy pile, encrusted with needle-like crystals. Those I had not sh those I had not shattered with my foot, but still recognizable as the ap epithesis of a long bone. Deformed and half buried as it was, I could not identify it precisely the femur of a small dragon, perhaps, or the brachial humerus of a larger one, too large to come from a bear. That much was certain. In a low voice, Jacob said, why has it not disintegrated? In a rush, my brain started to working again. I had been so distracted by the wonder of the dragon graveyard that I had clean forgotten the simplest facts of dragon osteology. Their bones did not survive long. Uh, did not long survive their deaths. Even the one we had hunted should have long since. De deteriorated to the point of collapsing under its own weight. This one had clearly been here long enough for stone to form around it. By now, uh, by now it should have been dust. We have to stop it here for now, but we have been reading from, give me a sec here, we've been reading from A Natural History of Dragons, the Put the bookmark back in. I don't want to be forgetting that. Um, a Natural History of Dragons, a memoir by Lady Trent, is a book by Marie Brennan. If you like this con content, then make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, or if you want to join the Discord server, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.